Welcome back to the Riffamonas Reproducible Research Tutorial Series. If you missed the introduction tutorial, please go back and check it out to learn the background behind the series and to familiarize yourself with our goals and where we're going to be going. As we go through these tutorials, there will be several discussion items that you should discuss over lunch, at your lab meeting, or individually with your research group and with your PI. For many of these questions, there are no, quote, right answers. Um, the concepts we will cover in these tutorials are difficult. That's part of the reason why there is a problem with reproducibility in science. Hopefully, you can have a good discussion on these uh, questions within your research group. There will also be a number of exercises for, uh, for you to work on where there is a correct answer. For these, remember that you can always hit the P key on your keyboard to pull up the presenter notes, which is where you will find the answer to these questions. Also, when these come up, you should pause the video to give yourself a few moments to think about the answer and to explore the materials further. In future tutorials, there will be hands-on coding exercises that we'll work on together. Of course, uh, you, you will want to do each of these activities to build your own background and expertise in handling issues that surround reproducibility. At the end of the tutorial series, there will be an opportunity for you to document your progress and receive a virtual badge and certification that you can include to document your participation in this tutorial. As I mentioned at the end of the last tutorial, today's tutorial is appropriate for those doing the analysis as well as those whose job is to primarily supervise scientists in their analyses. So let's go into today's material, which you can find in the Issues and Reproducible Research tutorial at rifamonis.org. Wonderful. Let's go ahead and pull up the slides for this session's tutorial. And remember, we can get to the slides by going to rifamonis.org clicking on training modules, followed by reproducible research. This pulls up the reproducible research tutorial series page, or along the left side in the middle of the screen are the listing of the various tutorials. Today we're going to focus on the session issues in reproducible research. So go ahead and click on that. Very good. So for today's tutorial, what we are going to focus on are several learning goals. The first is to discuss the origins of what's being called the reproducibility crisis. We want to differentiate between reproducibility and replicability. We're going to identify the pressure points in making our work reproducible. And then we're going to appraise ongoing and published research products for hallmarks of reproducible research. But before we go any further, I want to confirm that you've already taken a look at the Collins and Tabak editorial in Nature, the Casa Duval et al. editorial in MBio, and the editorial by Ravel and Womack that was published in Microbiome. They're short, but they're important takes on where we are in science in general, and in microbiology in particular. So, perhaps you're familiar with this fictitious journal, the Journal of Irreproducible Results. I know when I was working in the lab more, we frequently joked about people whose theses would wind up in this journal, that we would do great things in the lab, get really excited about it, but we before we told our PI, we might, well, let's just do it one more time, and sure enough, it, it wouldn't work out, um, and that we had, we had forgotten some control, or we had uh, forgotten some reagent, uh, and, and so the work just didn't reproduce. And so par the, the goal of this series of tutorials is really to avoid anyone thinking that their work belongs in the Journal of Irreproducible Results, that, that we want all of our work to be re reproducible because we want others to um, be able to follow up on what we're doing so that we can move science forward. And so two definitions that we're going to build from in this series of tutorials for rep reproducibility and replicability come from Jeff Leake and Roger Pang's editorial in the journal PNAS, published in 2015. In that, they define reproducibility as the ability to recompute data analytic results given an observed data set and knowledge of the data analysis pipeline. Okay, so if I know how you analyze the data, I have your data, can I get the same result? Replicability, in contrast, is the chance that an independent experiment targeting the same scientific question 
will produce a consistent result. Okay, so if somebody else does the experiment and uses our same general approach, do they get the same result? But beware, because depending on who's talking, the definitions that we're using here might be flipped. And so always be careful about how people are defining things. I find this is kind of similar to how many people talk about diversity in the microbiome literature. And I always wonder, did they actually measure diversity or do they mean richness or what exactly do they mean? Okay, so the same is true for thinking about rep reproducibility and replicability. Another framework that I like to think about comes from a talk given by Christy Whitaker and that she posted on Figshare that builds off of what Leek and Peng talked about. And so using the same or different code and using the same or different data, you can think of research as being reproducible, replicable, robust, or generalizable. I like this framework a lot because it really helps me to think about and contextualize different attempts to um, validate other people's research. And so I've built upon it a little bit. So instead of thinking about the same or different data, I think about the same or different populations or systems. So is the work done in mice versus humans? Is it done in different strains of mice? Is it different done in different cohorts of humans? Is it done using the same or different cell lines, right? Along the rows, we can think about the same or different methods. Did they use 16S RNA gene sequencing? Did they use metatranscriptomics? Did they use metabolomics? Did they do culturing, right? Did they use the same or different methods? And from that, then, if you, if you use the same population or system and the same methods, then we would hope that the work would be reproducible. In contrast, if you use a different population or system, say, um, instead of using people from Michigan in your study, use people from Korea, um, is the work replicable? Okay. Similarly, if, if we use multiple methods to triangulate on a result to increase the robustness of that result, we can then think about doing that in different populations or different systems to then test whether or not our result is generalizable. So as a pop quiz, what I'd like you to do is to think about different questions that I'm going to flash up here as being reproducible or replicable, okay? And so if you want, you can hit the pause button to think about it for a minute before uh, getting the answer from me. Okay, so a new person joins your lab and tries to repeat a previous lab member's experiments. That is an example of reproducibility. You download data from another lab, follow their methods, and you then try to regenerate their results. That also is an example of reproducibility. Next, you rerun the mouse model that you ran in a previous paper, but using a different strain. This, in contrast, is an example of replicability. Someone performs your study using a cohort of subjects from Korea. That is an example of replicability or perhaps generalizability. Finally, a colleague asks for your raw data and any scripts that you may have to repeat your earlier analysis. This is similar to the second question here and is an example of reproducibility. So something we might think about are what are the threats to reproducibility? What are the things that stand in the way of someone else trying to reproduce our work? Okay. And so what I'd like you to do is go ahead and pause the video and uh, jot down a list of bullet points or different things that you think can limit the ability of another person to reproduce your work or limit your ability to re reproduce another person's work. So go ahead and hit tab and take as much time as you need to generate that list. Here's the list of things that I came up with. Again, this is not the perfect list. It's not exhaustive. Um, and, and it's perhaps particular to what I'm thinking about uh, when I came up with the list. So many problems we have with data being available, uh, method sections being incomplete, uh, different 
operating systems behave differently. Uh, sometimes different programs are available on different operating systems, but not another. Uh, we know that our software and databases evolve. Mother, the software package I develop, is on version uh, 40. Uh, it has evolved a lot over those 40 versions, and so the results you get might get from version 1 to version 40 might be a little bit different. Um, there's also problems with methods rabbit holes, right, where you, you read a method and they say, well, we used, you, you read a paper and you, they say, well, we used this method. And so then you go to that paper describing that method, and then they say, well, this method is a, a mashup of two other methods. And so then you just keep going down and down and down the citation ladder, and as you go further and further down, you start to question what exactly did those original researchers do? Uh, there's the issue of random number generators. A lot of times in bioinformatics, we're doing things like bootstrapping or Monte Carlo simulations to calculate p-values. Uh, and so those use random number generators. And so we might get slightly different results each time we run the analysis. Uh, similar to the problem with short method sections and the rabbit holes, is that there's frequently details missing in a protocol. Uh, the availability of software, uh, that we know that many times people will say that the code is available upon request. Um, it's the problem of custom fill-in-the-blank scripts and filling in the blank with different programming language, right? So if I said I, you know, I did my analysis using custom Pascal scripts, but if nobody knows Pascal, then how reproducible is that going to be? Uh, there's also a problem of link rot, whether a URL or email address may, may lo no longer be accessible, right? So you, you go to contact the original researchers for the data, for the code, and you get an error message back saying, sorry, uh, that email address is no longer valid. Next, let's think about some threats to replicability. Again, the ability to get the same result using a different population or system. So again, take a few minutes and jot down several ideas for things that might limit our ability, our ability to replicate another group's research. So again, my own list, not the perfect list, not exhaustive, but list of things that I think a lot about in terms of replicability. So first, it might not be a real effect, right? So that, that first study that found the result um, may have been mistaken. It may have been reproducible, but it, it might not have been a real effect. Or it, um, there might be problems with mathematical models, statistical models that we're using that overfit the data in the original study that then just can't be validated in a replication study. There's a problem of poor experimental design where things aren't controlled for that needed to be. Problems with contaminated or mistaken reagents. Um, you know, we think we have the cell line or the, the specific strain of bacteria only to find out later that we were sent the wrong strains. Problems with confounding variables, variables that we're just not controlling for because we don't think about for some reason. Uh, di differences in sex. We might do an experiment using male mice. Someone else might do it using female mice. And we might get different results because it's due to differences in sex. And same, same thing might happen with differences in age or differences in mouse genotype. Um, and and those, those factors of thinking about sex, age, and genotype are, are actually pretty interesting, right? They, they raise up other biological questions that we might be interested in following up. There might also be differences in reagents or populations, environments, storage conditions. Uh, there also might be the problem of sloppiness, right? Where the original researchers may have not been thinking thoroughly about they're doing what they're doing um, they, we might also be thinking about, um, you know, poor laboratory skills, contaminated reagents again, things like that. Uh, there's also a problem of selection and experimental bias, that um, we see a result in the literature and we then want to, um, to, to test it with our own population, our own system, and what we don't know is that 20 other people have tried the same thing and have failed to replicate it as well, right? And so that that one study stands out because it was a huge result, but the fact is that it stands out because nobody published all the negative studies. And then there's the problem of experimental bias where we find a result and now we go looking for further proof of that result, not trying to find proof against the result. And of course, 
there's always the concern about fraud and scientific misconduct. So I hope you might see yourself or have experiences with all of these bullet points of threats to reproducibility and replicability. And the point I want to make is that this stuff is really hard. Science is hard. It is difficult to do reproducible research that others can replicate. There's no getting around it. It is hard. And so this brings us to editorial by Arturo Casadevall and his colleagues that is questioning the quality of research in the biological sciences and specifically the problems of reproducibility in microbiology. And this grew out of an American Academy for Microbiology report uh, from a, their colloquium that they did discussing problems in the sciences um, and thinking about reproducible and replicable research. They focused on three main causes for the lack of reproducibility. These included sloppy science, selection and experimental bias, and misconduct. So we had those, and at least I had those in my list. Um, but as we saw, there's, there's many other reasons uh, that are less glamorous or less, um, maybe we say they're, they're more humble <laughs> reasons uh, for why we might have a problem with reproducibility or replicability. And so I feel like blaming our problems on these three issues is really naive and short-sighted. And, and I'd like to think that if, if you or me were in the room at that colloquium, we perhaps would have come up with different reasons than these three for the problems in reproducibility and replicability. And so a question to think about as we all focus on trying to improve the reproducibility and replicability of our research is, is that research that's perfectly reproducible, perfectly replicable, is it necessarily correct? And I would say no, but I'm optimistic that research that is done well uh, and is described well and is transparent is more likely to be done correctly. If nothing else, it provides an avenue for others to see how sensitive an analysis is to deviations from um, the, the, the pipeline that we propose and to perhaps go back and figure out where we were wrong in our assumptions or incorrect in our data analysis. Following up on that, is a result that fails to replicate someone's quote, fault? Can we blame somebody if we can't replicate previous work? And I would say not necessarily. Sure, there's problems of sloppiness and bias and uh, fraud, but we might also be talking about biological phenomenon that we haven't captured. And it's also important to keep in mind that replication is a product of biological as well as statistical variation. Um, that, that a small p-value does not guarantee the correct result. So as we move forward, a theme that we're going to come back to time and again is the issue of documentation transparency. And so I love this meme because it, it gets to the root of a lot of issues we have with reproducibility and replicability. Right? I'd love to draw this beautiful owl. And so the instructions in the book are how to draw an owl, draw two circles, draw the rest of the owl. Um, and, and so, sure, those are instructions, those are methods. Somebody could perhaps use them to draw an owl, uh, but th it's really not reproducible. It wouldn't tell me much about, say, how to draw a pigeon or a, a robin, right? Um, and, and I believe that there's a reproducibility crisis, if you want to call it that, because our description of methods is pretty lacking. We need to learn how to use existing technology to virtually, electronically say, expand our methods sections. And so I'd like you to think about a case study that is very common um, and it never ceases to amaze me how unprepared I am for this when it happens. That say my lab publishes a paper that's really awesome, that gets a lot of attention and I start getting emails from people asking about the nitty gritty of how we did things, not because they want to throw rocks, but because they want to do it too. Unfortunately, because of how peer review works, the trainee now is long gone. Um, they're off to a new exciting job doing fun and exciting problems. And, and they are very slow to answer my emails. Okay. I, I suspect if you talk about this with your PI or other researchers, they'll have this problem as well. And, and perhaps you've also been the person to email the PI asking questions. And so what happens uh, when you request this information from the author? 
And, and if you, have you ever been on the other side of this and, and been asked for information and what happens? And so what I'd like you to do is think about these questions and, and discuss them with your PI and, and have a discussion about this and, and perhaps motivate a, a justification for why reproducibility and replicability are important. And, and then I'd like you to think also about what can you do to be proactive to avoid these cases? How do we not have that anxiety when we get these emails from people saying, what did you do here? I don't understand. Um, a lot of information is embedded in laboratory notebooks. So how useful are laboratory notebooks when we get these emails, especially as it relates to a computational analysis? And then how long are you responsible for maintaining these records? Okay, sure, if you get an email the day the thing's published, you're on the hook, but you know, three months later, six months later, a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, you know, how long are you responsible for maintaining that? And then how long can you reasonably expect someone to be helpful? I would hope that, uh, again, the day my paper's published, that the trainee is going to be responsive and helpful. But again, five, 10 years later, do I expect them to be helpful? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so, but I don't know when exactly uh, it transitions from expecting someone to be helpful or to have the records to not having the records or not be helpful. And so this was a real question and an interesting um, thing that we all run into is getting these emails or getting requests for further information. And so again, discuss this with your PI, discuss this with your lab. Uh, what, what are some of the stories from your lab of when this has happened and, and what do you do? What does your PI do? What are their strategies for dealing with this issue? So Philip Bourne baited others into doing this experiment with him. So they published a paper in 2010 looking at the mycobacterium tuberculosis drugome. And he encouraged people at a, a workshop in 2011 to try to reproduce the work in that paper. Um, and, and Bourne is a thought leader I would consider in the field of bioinformatics, very sensitive to issues of reproducibility. And they did an audit of how long it would take people at varying stages of their career and familiarity with bioinformatics skills to reproduce a pipeline, to reproduce the results from the paper. And what they found was that if you had somebody that had pretty basic um, skills in bioinformatics, that it would take them 160 hours to get up to speed with the workflow and software. Okay, So that's four 40-hour weeks just getting up to speed on the workflow. And then it would took another 120 hours to actually implement the workflow. So I'm not convinced that that's, while it is reproducible, I think it's beyond the level <laughs> um, that a lot of us are willing to spend to reproduce somebody's work. And so it really sheds a lot of light on um, what do we mean by reproducible? How much friction, if you will, do we allow and still say that something is reproducible? If it takes 160 hours, is that reproducible? What, what knowledge does an individual have to have to be able to reproduce the work? And keep in mind that you're the person doing the work that knows far more about the work than anybody else ever will. Um, and so assuming that somebody has the same skill set as you is probably a bad assumption. Okay. So a lot of the issue and discussion around the reproducibility crisis comes from two papers that I'd briefly like to mention. The first comes from scientists at Bayer, and they stated that there's an unspoken rule among early stage venture capital firms that at least 50% of published studies, even those in top tier academic journals, can't be repeated with the same conclusions by an industrial lab. Okay, so say Bayer sees a really cool result from an academic researcher, they want to perhaps convert that into uh, a product for uh, selling commercially, but they find that at least 50% of those preclinical studies just cannot be repeated. And so in this review, they, they talk about, um, I think there's about uh, 67 or so, so, maybe 70 studies that they had tried to reproduce or replicate at Bayer. And what they found was that uh, there were inconsistencies in about 65% of the studies they studied, um, and that only about 4% uh, were some of the results reproducible. 
um, and 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 in about five or seven percent, I'm sorry, of the studies where the main data set was reproducible. Okay, and so this is a this seems like a problem, right? Where a large fraction of the studies that they were testing just could not be reproduced. Now, there are subtleties to this because they were not doing exact uh, um, reproductions. These we would perhaps by our rubric consider to be replications, where perhaps they were using uh, different mouse models, so they were using a different setup to fit what they were doing in their labs. But still, it, it points to an issue. The next study The next study was published by Amgen, um, by Begley at Ellis, and they found that regardless of the impact factor of the journal that the original result was published in, that they found many of those studies also were not reproducible or replicable. And furthermore, they pointed out that um, a number of other studies would come on after the initial result, trying to follow up on specific points or um, building off of the earlier work to take the work further. And so their point is that there's a lot of wasted time and resources in trying to build upon flawed science. And so they state that cancer researchers must be more rigorous in their approach to preclinical studies. Given the inherent difficulties of mimicking the human microenvironment in preclinical research, researchers and editors should demand greater thoroughness. Okay, so This is a very negative, I would say, gotcha uh, science type of attitude um, and so but there's something that maybe you've noticed <laughs> uh, if you've looked at these articles is that neither study did anything to demonstrate that their work as demonstrated in these studies these reviews could be reproduced the, the very thin details as to what they did how they tried to reproduce or replicate these experiments um, and so um, you maybe want to pause and think deeply about how much we want to um, focus on these two reviews. Okay? But at the same time, there is a general sense that science is hard. Science has gotten very complicated in you know, the last decades. And that, that we are not doing a good job of ensuring the reproducibility and replicability of our own research. And so to that, uh, Collins and Tabak published an editorial in Nature in 2014 talking about NIH's response to the so-called reproducibility crisis. And they point out a handful of uh, problems that they then wanted to follow up on in policy changes at NIH. So they talk about publications that rarely report basic elements of experimental design, things like blinding, blinding randomization, replication, sample size, effective sex differences, uh, the underlying data are really ma made available. There's a problem because there's restrictions on the lengths of, of method sections. And then as we saw with the Bourne paper, they assume that the reader is at an idealized level of expertise. That's just not practical. So NIH has focused on a lot of these social factors. Um, and so the idea that we fail to publish negative results, this is commonly called the file drawer problem, that we stick our negative results into a file drawer and never report them again. Um, some scientists, they say, reputedly use a secret sauce to make their experiments work. This was a problem, lack of transparency. There's also perverse incentives to publish and hype striking results. And this ties in with the idea of the impact factor mania, where people are very focused on getting their work published into a journal with a high impact factor that you know the ability to secure a k award or to get tenure or promotion is tied to the number of papers that you have in journals with uh, very high impact factors and as i said nih has gone out of the way now to go ahead and think about uh, new guidelines that they have imposed to improve the reproducibility and replicability of their 
of, of our research and thinking about how do we justify the premise, experimental design issues, what are biologically v um, relevant variables, how do we authenticate our reagents to know that they are what we think they are. Uh, there's been a big push by NIH to improve the reproducibility and replicability of ongoing research, and much of these efforts are focused on um, what we are calling replicability. Okay, uh, This tutorial series was funded in part by an R25 that I received from NIH dealing with reproducibility in the area of microbiome research. So thinking about the microbiome world, Jacques Ravel and Eric Womack published an editorial in Microbiome called All, ha All Hail Reproducibility in Microbiome Research. And so this was one of the assigned readings before this tutorial. So I want to ask what your initial thoughts were about this. What do you think? One of the comments that jumped out at me was when they said, it is no mistake that the best documented code turns out to be more frequently used by microbiome researchers. That if you go out of your way to make your data available, you make your code available, you document it, you make it clear what you've done, it is going to get cited. It is going to be widely used. Um, I have certainly experienced that with our mother software package, that by making it as open and transparent and well documented as we can, we have gotten a large number of citations because we have engaged in those practices. So what I'd like you to do is take the next four or five minutes and read back through this editorial and see if you can identify three or four different technologies or platforms that the authors point to for improving reproducibility of microbiome research. So go ahead and hit pause, and once you've done that, go ahead and come back. All right, so they, they focus on several tools related to data accessibility, including uh, depositing sequence data in the sequence read archive, as well as in dbGaP. Other data um, we might put into a website called Figshare as a repository for data. Using a metadata standard called MimMarks. Writing our code and our workflow together using tools like uh, the Project Jupyter notebooks, which they call in this editorial IPython. Uh, there's been a switch in name since this was published, as well as Knitter documents in the R environment. And then finally, they also talk about using version control tools, including software like Git, as well as a website built on top of Git called GitHub. And so as we go through this series of tutorials, we're going to describe how we would use these different tools um, to improve the reproducibility of our own research. We're also going to go considerably further than uh, Ravel and Womack went in this editorial to further improve the reproducibility of our research. So if we think about microbiome research in particular, we might think about different threats to reproducibility and replicability. Okay? And so these are things that I want to build on beyond the lists that we came up with earlier. And so one of the issues is a lack of standard methods. And this is a very thorny issue with a lot of people, myself included, because we pick our methods to answer specific questions that are relevant to us today, right? Like I use the variable region I use to sequence the 6GNS gene because I've got a specific set of questions. Well, if you're studying a different set of questions or in a different part of the body, you might want to use a different region. That's going to make it really difficult to compare our results in a meaningful way. The accessibility of data is still a big problem. Not everybody is depositing data in the SRA. Not everybody is providing metadata to actually make that data useful. Um, we all use different populations. That's kind of the beauty of um, the microbiome field right now, is that there are people asking the same question in different cohorts. We also have really complicated and lengthy data analysis pipelines. You know, there's many steps, there's many parameters, many variables we might use, different options for different databases we might use. Um, it's, it's complicated, it's lengthy. One of the things that drives me nuts is reading a manuscript that says, we analyzed our 6 s data using Mother. And that's it, right? They don't say anything about how they used Mother. I know, use it as the Mother developer, that there's thousands of ways you could use Mother to analyze your data. 
And so we need greater clarity uh, to help us through this complexity and lengthiness of our data analysis pipelines. There's variation in our mouse colonies. If you look at the gut microbiota of mice from Jackson versus Taconic versus those uh, in the breeding facility here at the University of Michigan, we're going to see big differences. Those differences can cause differences in the phenotypes we're interested in. We also know that there are contaminants that show up from our reagents when we're sequencing low biomass samples. This has raised a lot of questions in regards to whether or not there's a microbiome associated with uh, the placenta or with lungs. We also know that there are sampling artifacts where how we store our samples, what we do with our samples, um, the size of our samples can all um, introduce artifacts that um, are going to impact our downstream results. What I'd like you to do next is go back to that Ravel and Womack editorial and look at the paper by Meadows et al as well as the GitHub repository that they cite um, in their paper. And so I'm going to pull that up for you here. And so this is the GitHub site that has the repository for Meadows et al. And what I'd like you to do is take some time to see how accessible is the code. Okay, okay the code is here. How accessible is it? What Can you make heads or tails of what's going on? What do you need to know to make sense of the repository? Does Is it structured? Is it organized in a way that you can understand what's going on? Is it well documented? Um, how long did it take you to find the code for the figures in the paper? Okay, so go ahead and, and go through this and think about um, about the reproducibility or how, how this helps improve the reproducibility of uh, the paper from Meadows et al. Great, so I really, my hat, I tip my hat to Meadows et al. because they put this up at a time when very few people were thinking about how to make their work more reproducible. And so I really credit them with doing a good job of making their code accessible. That being said, I think there's still a number of points that they could improve upon to make the work more reproducible, more transparent, more accessible. So first of all, the sequence data that they published was deposited in the FigShare and not into the Sequence Read Archive. Um, there have been times in the past where the Sequence Read Archive has been really difficult to work with for submitting 16S data, and I suspect that's why they ultimately put it into FigShare. It's not a big project, but still the code isn't very well organized. It doesn't jump out at me where the data are, where the code is, where the output is. Um, a good thing is that the RMD file provides the narrative to explain what's happening and why they made different decisions. And the, the code for the figure is in the lilisurfaces.rmd file, and it's rendered in the lilisurfaces.md file. Okay. And so it's there. Um, I could certainly find areas to improve upon. But again, as a first step, and one of the first studies that really dug into making their work more reproducible, I think they did a great job. If we come forward in time a bit, um, we might think about um, more recent microbiome papers and how well they've gone out of their way to make their code, their analysis more reproducible. And so I'm taking um, three repositories from my own research group for three papers over the last few years. I don't consider these to be perfect. I think if you go through from Zacular to Baxter to Z, you'll see differences and changes in how my group has appro approached ensuring the reproducibility of our data analysis pipelines. And so something that we can use as a checklist to assess a recent microbiome paper might be how difficult is it to regenerate a p-value or a figure, right? Could we go all the way back to raw data to regenerate that p-value or a figure? 
Where are the raw data? Is the code available? How long is the methods section? Do they do that thing where they say we used mother? <laughs> um, or do they tell you about the databases they used? Do they cite the R packages that they used? Okay. So I'd really encourage you to go through these three examples that I think are pretty good. I'm biased, of course, but at the same time, I know we've evolved in how we approach these types of repositories and our approach to ensuring that things are reproducible. So go ahead and pause the video and take a few minutes to check out those repositories. <coughs> Great, so I hope you enjoyed looking at those and the, the repository that we see for ZN Schloss is more along the lines of what we're going to have as an output from our work at the end of this series of tutorials. So why is reproducibility and replicability important? Perhaps we think that's obvious, right? Well, obviously, we want to make sure that our results are correct and or generalizable. And I think this is where most people stop when they're thinking about reproducibility and replicability. They're thinking about correctness, right? And as we said earlier, just because something is reproducible doesn't necessarily mean it's correct. I'm also interested in making sure that others can build off of my work, um, right? And I also want them to take my work and repurpose the materials and metho methods to do something different, right? So um, we've done a lot in the area of um, finding signatures of colorectal cancer using 16S RNA gene sequencing. Well, if somebody publishes a new study doing the same type of thing and they don't use my data, that's a bummer. <laughs> I mean, we, we invested a lot of time and effort and, ener and money into generating and analyzing those data. It'd be a shame that others wouldn't use those data to build upon for their own work. Um, similarly, if people have looked at our code and found it useful to answer a question for a certain set of um, subjects or experiments, I would hope they'd find it useful for their own set of conditions and experiments and populations. So ultimately, I think of reproducible research as being a form of preventative medicine. And this is a phrase that was coined by Jeff Leake and Roger Pang in that editorial I mentioned at the beginning of this tutorial. There's way too much emphasis on gotcha science, way too much emphasis on the Amgen and Bayer papers. Research that's done in a manner to maximize reproducibility it's gonna make life easier for you in the long run, right? So you get that email from someone that's excited about your work. If you could send them to the repository that has all your code and it's well-documented, wouldn't that be amazing? It's gonna instill more confidence in others and then it's gonna be easier for others to build from, okay? And so really think about this as a form of preventative medicine, as a way of fostering collaboration with others going forward. And so as we think about collaboration, your collaborators need to be able to reproduce your research. And so who has to be able to reproduce your research? I told you this at the end of the last tutorial, but you, you have to be able to reproduce your own research um, and think about that in six months from now, right? Um, and, and think that current you no longer has access to email. What, how would you write for yourself six months from now knowing that you couldn't get in a time machine or email old you to figure out what you were doing. Okay, so take care of yourself. Um, be preemptive in how you think about reproducibility. Second, your PI is, your import, is an important collaborator. They need to be able to reproduce what you're doing because at some point you're hopefully gonna graduate and move on to greener pastures and your PI is gonna be left behind to figure out what the heck you did, <laughs> um, and how they can communicate that to other researchers who want to build upon your work, but also their own work, right? So where are we going with this series of tutorials? So we're going to spend a lot of time in the next session talking about documentation um, in terms of text-based documentation, but also in future talks about um, data organization as a form of documentation, using code as a form of documentation, um, and, and thinking about automation as a form of documentation, right? That if we can tell the computer how to run the analysis in an automated way, well, 
then we need to com convert from computer speak, from code, uh, to human uh, text to understand what's going on. And along the ways, we'll learn some best practices like keeping our raw data raw as much as possible and not touching it with our, with our hands or with our cursor, um, not repeating ourselves with our code, and then using tools that enable collaboration and transparency. So in closing, I'd like you to spend some time thinking about a, a series of questions. Okay. And again, think about discussing these with your PI and your, with your research group, with your friends. So first, how difficult would it be for you to regenerate any of the figures or p-values from a paper that your lab published five years ago? So if you open up a paper from five years ago and go to figure two, how difficult would it be for you uh, or one of your current lab mates to figure out how to regenerate that plot, that figure? For your next paper, what's the most important thing that you can do to improve the reproducibility of that data analysis? So Amgen and Bear said they thought it was about 50%, but what percent of papers published in your field do you think are reproducible, replicable, and then, and then why do you come up with those numbers? And then finally, building out upon your two important collaborators of yourself and your, your PI, what other, what other broad groups of people need to be able to reproduce or replicate your work? Um, and, and think about them in terms of their own skill sets and their own knowledge, right? Um, and this gets back to the idea of the Born paper where it took somebody with decent bioinformatics skills a long period of time to get up to speed with the analysis that was done in a previous paper. Okay? Wonderful. Hopefully you found today's discussion helpful in getting you to think about your own reproducible research practices and where there might be gaps in your practices. At the same time, I hope you can have a greater appreciation that everybody has gaps in their practices. This stuff is really hard. Please be sure to take the time to engage those in your research group, your lab mates, your PIs, those around your lab, to discuss the material and questions that came up in today's tutorial. Next time, we'll start to develop more practical steps to a greater reproducibility. We'll slowly be ratcheting up the technical material in the next tutorial. Until then, have fun engaging these questions and having discussions with those around you, those you're doing research with. I think you'll find it to be really useful really illuminating, and really helping to point the direction as you grow in your own ability to do reproducible and replicable research.